Hey folks, welcome to the program. This is the Other People Podcast. I'm Brad Listy, and I'm in Los Angeles. It's nice to be with you. I appreciate you tuning in and I hope you are doing okay wherever you happen to be. Today is Friday, so it's time for another flashback episode. I'm going to be sharing an outtake from episode 99, my conversation with Elizabeth Ellen, author and publisher. Our conversation first aired on August 26th, 2012. Elizabeth Ellen's stories have been published in a wide variety of publications, including American Short Fiction, Harper's Magazine, Moo Moo House, and Joyland. She is the recipient of a Pushcart Prize for her story entitled Teen Culture, and she is the author of several books, including Fast Machine and Persona. In 2024, Clash Books will be publishing her novel entitled American Thighs. An outtake from episode 99, my conversation with Elizabeth Ellen is coming up in just a couple of minutes. So a quick reminder before we get going that I do a weekly email newsletter. I would love it if you would subscribe. You can do so for free over at Substack. That is where my newsletter lives, bradlisty.substack.com. It's pretty simple. I will let you know on a weekly basis about the latest episodes of this program. I also share a list of links to things that I've been reading and finding interesting. So if you want to hear from me in your inbox once a week, go sign up for the newsletter over at Substack. Likewise, there is an Other People Patreon community. I would love it if you would join that. If you like this show, if you get something from it, if you listen regularly, I hope you will consider heading over to patreon.com slash otherpplpod and help keep this show going into the future. Get yourself some Other People merchandise, a t-shirt, a tote bag, a coffee mug. Get an Other People book club subscription over at patreon.com slash otherpplpod. All right, so let's get to today's flashback. Once again, I'm going to be sharing an outtake from episode 99, my conversation with Elizabeth Ellen, which first aired on August 26th, 2012. A reminder that the full episode is available in the feed. So if you like this outtake, if you like what you hear, and you want to listen to the full conversation with Elizabeth Ellen, you can do that. Just search for episode 99. It is there waiting for you. All right. So let's get going with today's main event. This is Elizabeth Allen. No, I'm glad I'm glad to have had some whiskey on hand for you. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. What is your uh, whiskey of choice? Makers. Is it really? Yeah. Yeah, I've always I always go with Makers and I that just yeah. that started when I was like a teenager. Yeah, I had Makers last night. It's- the best i think okay so you're out in los angeles from the midwest yes you live in michigan yes ann arbor and uh you know what what brought you there i guess we were just talking before we came on the air here and you were saying that you're from the center of ohio right and then you wound up in ann arbor i wound up in ann arbor because i got married to my first husband and he was from michigan we met in ohio and uh shortly thereafter we moved back to Michigan. And then when we got divorced, I had to stay in Michigan because we have a child together. Gotcha. What what kind of, what, a boy or a girl? A girl. What what kind of child is this? (laughs) She's (laughs) 16. She's, uh, she's great. Uh, you know? Yeah. It's like, see, I have a two year old daughter. So now I'm like, I I can't help but imagine like leaping forward. Is it weird when they grow up and they develop their own? Yeah. I mean, she's like my best friend, which I don't know if that's kosher to say or whatever, but yeah, we, we get along great, and I'm glad that I have her. Yeah, I mean, but it's like, I mean, uh, I guess I'm at the age right now where everything's extremely cute, and she's learning how to talk, and yeah. is there any kind of rebellion at all? What do I have, <laughs> um, to, what do, I what do I have eighth, to be afraid of? <laughs> eighth grade was the closest my daughter came to rebellion, which still wasn't much, but experimenting a little bit, and now she's back on straight path, I guess. Yeah. So I think it's a testament, a <laughs> testament to your uh, unbelievable parenting skills. <laughs> right, I think I just got lucky. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so let's talk about uh, where you're from in, in Ohio and how you, you know, uh, um, grew up. Like, what, what kind of uh, town were you from? Very rural. I'm from a small town in between Cleveland and Columbus, like an hour from either big city, but we didn't go there much. And uh, I just grew up in, uh, we were always moving different rented farmhouses and, um, I don't know. I don't know why we we're always moving so much because we didn't move school districts, but I, we would just always move different apartments and houses. And uh, I don't know. My mom moved us around. She just wanted to change it up. <laughs> just yeah. Find some new know. interior design. Yeah. Yeah. So were you, you know, were you, was it a farm family? No, not at all. We just, she always seemed to rent farmhouses, but um, it was, my mom was a single mom. She was married for part of the time that I was growing up, but not, not too long. So it was just the two of us mostly. And she was a bartender and racquetball court manager and that, you know, doing two jobs to raise a child. And racquetball feels old school. Yeah, it is old school. She was actually like jazzercise instructor. (laughs) She was like an Ohio (laughs) state uh, women's champion one year and she was really into it. Yeah. I remember uh, there was like a, a girl that I went to high school with and Um, her dad was very fancy and they had a racquetball court in their house. Oh, like Elvis. Yeah. And so that we used to, I used to think that was like the coolest thing. We would all get drunk in high school and like hang out in the racquetball court. Yeah. My friends and I would, cause she managed the racquetball court and we would go there and I don't know, mess around in the sauna and the whirlpool and get in trouble that way. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you were raised with your, uh, your mom, Mm -hmm. single mom. Where was your dad? Was he just absent or was he? Um, well, he lived in Florida. He was remarried. They never actually lived together. They were married, but broke up on the honeymoon, basically an extended honeymoon. And so too long, (laughs) should have cut it short. (laughs) Right. So she was really young. She was like 18 when she got married and he was 26. And so he remarried, he lived in Florida. And once I was about eight or nine, I'd go down every summer for a couple weeks and stay with him. And, uh, but other than that, where in Florida, uh, Lakeland, what is that near Orlando? Mm. Or no, am I wrong? Yeah. Uh, is well, it's it actually, coastal? It's like an hour. From, no, it's inland. It's like an hour from Tampa, I think. Okay. It's kind of in the middle. Florida's a weird place. Yeah. Do you think so? Yeah. Yeah. And then later I went to boarding school in Florida for a year and which I don't recommend. And <laughs> <laughs> it's, I don't know. It's a weird state. It's like a whole different culture. I don't know what it, yeah. Like I, I was there years ago, probably five or six years ago, uh, my wife was working in Miami and I flew down there just to kind of like hang out and, um, spend time with her. We kind of took a couple of extra days in Miami and I just, I couldn't wrap my head around it. I don't know. I guess people probably say the same thing about LA, but yeah, wherever you're not used to my mom's in Key West now, which again is completely different too, from the rest of Florida. It's more like the Caribbean, but Key West, yeah, Key West is almost like separate from the United. It's as yeah. close as you can come. If you're going to be in Florida, Key West is probably the place to be. But yeah, it's yeah. such a haul to get down there. You spend a lot of time down there? No, no, like once a year at best because it's just such a hassle to get down there. Well, yeah, how far is it from Miami? You fly to Miami and then it's uh, like maybe what? like an hour flight. It's a flight. Yeah, yeah. I mean, fly. you could drive, but that's probably, I want to say, three hours because you have to drive through the whole Keys. Yeah, I was which, thinking of like that highway that's like on yeah. stilts through the water yeah, or whatever. It's, yeah, it's... And, and they are called stilts, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that, but yeah. Yeah, that's a two-hour drive just down that highway. Have you been to uh, like Hemingway's house and yeah. done all that stuff? Uh, yeah, I've been there three or four times and seen all the cats. And In fact, uh, Mary Miller and I are trying to set up a Key West reading because she's never been there and we, I want to take her to the Hemingway house and show her everything. Yeah. Is it a good, is it a cool house? Is yeah, it, it's, it's really good awesome. to see. Uh, yeah. I just finished, uh, I was reading earlier this spring. I read a book by a Paul Hendrickson called Hemingway's boat. Okay. Like every once in a while, like I, for what you know, I, as a young man, I was fixated on Hemingway, like teenager or whatever, like one yeah. of my early, like just like so many guys, but yeah, you have to go through the Hemingway. Yeah, phase. I went through, yeah, I went through the Hemingway phase, but I find myself like every, I don't know, a couple of years, I pick up another biography. Like I've read a million of these things, Yeah. but like his, like the whole writer is rock star thing. And I kind of went through this too, when Gore Vidal just died, like these, oh, okay. these writers who actually lived, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that life where, you know, Gore Vidal was on the cover of time magazine and I right. guess, you know, they're Jonathan Franzen's on the cover of time, but it just seems like from another it era. It seem like he's living the life like Hemingway or something. Yeah. Well, yeah. He's not, <laughs> not judging, but there's <laughs> he's, he's bird watching. He's not hunt, killing yeah. lions yeah. with his bare hands or whatever. A little but, different. but yeah, no, anyway, I, I read Hemingway's boat and it's all about, um, you know, the period of his life when he lived in uh, Key West in Cuba. Mm-hmm. 
And it was all about how central the boat was to his uh, imagination and his emotional world. And I don't know, it was like a really interesting take. It kind of had a lot of stuff in it that I hadn't read before, which, right. you know, a lot of that, a lot of those uh, stories have been told a million times. But. Mm -hmm. So uh, back to the Midwest okay. in Ohio, um, were you from a very young age, writerly? Um, I would say probably that I wanted to be a writer. My mother was very into the New Yorker and the Paris Review. And I think she probably wanted to be a writer at some point and had written a bunch of poetry when I was a baby. And then I think she sent it out like a couple of places and it was rejected. So she gave up kind of, but, um, she always gave me books to read and, were you, were you aware that she was doing these submissions and writing this stuff when you no, were a kid? No, this was when I was a baby, baby. But she showed me the, she had like a manila envelope with the poems in them. And there was one that was written to me and, you know, to her husband at the time. And so I was aware that they, that they were there and, you know, read them. And, and so, I don't know, we had some kind of literary influence in the house. No, but you know, like, it's weird. I, I talked to uh, a lot of writers, obviously, and it, consistently there's always something, you know, it's always mm -hmm. like someone in your life, an adult tells you that you're good at this. Mm -hmm. uh, I hear that a lot. Or you have a parent who's doing it in some way. And it's amazing the impression that makes. I mean, it's, it can sound a little hokey and a little bit um, maudlin or something to yeah. talk about it. We're like, you know, if it wasn't for that teacher, you know, but yeah, that's I definitely the think <laughs> the fact that she had the Paris Review in the house and the New Yorker and just having it there and picking it up, you know, whenever and looking at it influenced me and I was reading us weekly as a child <laughs> how I wound up here. <laughs> well, people never too late. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, so, okay. So you, you had those influences and then were you writing as a young girl? Mm, I don't think so. I was more reading, but not writing. Although I remember just as a teenager writing letters to my friends and my friends being like, Oh, you write so fancy. Like you think you're a writer, you know, like just that, I just, even in a letter to them, they thought it seemed something. So that was the only thing though. I didn't write stories or anything. Nothing like that. Mm -mm. Uh, were you a good kid? Yeah, I was pretty boring and shy and good. You were? <laughs> yeah. No crazy streak or anything? I think because my mom was busy working and I was home alone a lot and I didn't have any siblings and I was shy. And so I, d I don't know. I didn't take advantage of the fact that, you know, I was home alone and yeah, you could have been the one who had all the parties. <laughs> right, but I don't know. I, other, uh, there was one party at my grandfather's my senior year, but aside from that, we didn't... At your grandfather's? My grandfather went out of town, and I was his angel, and he gave me the key to the car, and then I broke his heart. But uh, <laughs> it was one of those you invite four friends, and the whole your whole class comes, which is like 200 people. And Right. That so, happened to me, too. Like I, yeah. I used to have parties at my parents' house. One time we... I want to say did you know did a lot of damage to the kitchen floor. Yeah. By accident, things got out of hand. Well, my grandfather refused to believe it was me, and he went down to the bar where my mom worked and accused her of doing it. And she's like, "Dad, I have a house. If I want to have a party, I have." Because he just couldn't believe that I had done it, and so it was. It was he held you up traumatic. so high. <laughs> I know, <laughs> and, and I let shattered. him down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, that was pretty bad. Okay, so I mean, just and you were shy. Yeah. Are you still shy? Um, a little bit, but I've tried to get over it, but yeah, I was morbidly shy. Like I couldn't talk to guys or anything like that in high school. Yeah. In, in junior high, none of it. Mm -mm. Yeah. I think I was shy. I mean, I, I had some shyness, but it was only like when it came to like asking girls out, Okay. you know, like I could talk yeah. to people, but as soon as things like approached that level, it was like, no, I couldn't even, like all my friends dated and were always had guys around, but I couldn't talk to them. And at, when I went to my class reunion, like nobody remembered me because I was so shy. <laughs> Really? Yeah, there was like my I'm three surprised. my three friends and like a couple other people and nobody else. Even when I told them my name, they didn't remember me. Did you maybe if you remind them of your grandfather's party? <laughs> yeah, a couple. That's a couple. A couple of the guys did remember that party, <laughs> but aside from that, nothing. Wow. Okay. So you uh, you just didn't talk to any like any guys at all. Like mm -mm, no just, prom, no prom or anything no, like that. No, I didn't go to prom. I didn't go homecoming. Nothing like that. And you, were you sitting in the back of the class, like the <laughs> proverbial kid? Probably, of, yeah, just being really quiet and invisible. And I talked to my three girlfriends, and other than that, I didn't really talk to people. Good student? No, not really. In fact, I thought I was a better student than I was. And then my daughter, we got out my old report cards, and it was a real mix of A's, B's, C's, and a couple D's. So. It was a variety. Yeah. 
Um, She's a much better student than I was. <laughs> so, but you were you were obviously gravitating toward English. Even, yeah, like those those that was your strong suit. Yeah, when I went to college for a year, I did major in English, like thinking that was what I wanted to do. Okay, so yeah, what about college? You so left went, you left high school and then what? Yeah, I went to the University of Cincinnati and um, for a year and majored in English and was completely lost in the big university setting and ended up just dropping out. You just. I, just, I went to the classes I liked and didn't go the ones I didn't, which doesn't really work out. And I got put on academic probation and then I just never went back. And that was it. Yep. You never, <laughs> That's you never the went extent to... <laughs> of my education. <laughs> okay. Moving on. <laughs> uh, but I know how long were you just there for one year? Yeah. I ended up living in Cincinnati, um, with a boyfriend for another year or two, but I didn't. So you met a boy. Yeah. In college, I finally came out of my shell. Okay. So <laughs> what, what happened? Did you just get drunk and start talking? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't know. I just, I had to make friends. I didn't know anybody there. And I guess. Yeah, I just started. I mean, that really is the function. When you think about like, you know, adolescents uh, drinking or you think about college students drinking, like a, a majority of the function of it is just so you can get enough courage to talk to somebody. Right. So and I had drank a little bit in high school, but apparently not enough. So. Not enough. <laughs> right. It's a shame. If you could go back in time, yeah. you just would have started earlier. Everything would have been different. Right. Um, okay. So you met this boy. You were in Cincinnati. You were living there. You had uh, dropped out of college. Right. What were you thinking? <laughs> like, what were you, you know, did you have a plan or were you just like, no, none? I had no plan. This was probably, I don't know about the lowest point of my life, but it was definitely like, I had no idea what I was going to do. And actually my paternal grandmother was still sending me checks as if I was in school. So I was just cashing the checks to sell, telling her I was in school and supporting my boyfriend and myself <laughs> and just kind of, I didn't know what to do. I was just reading a lot and that's kind of when I had panic attacks and this whole thing. Cause I didn't, I didn't know what I was going to do. And then eventually I moved, I broke up with that boyfriend and moved away. So, so what about these panic attacks? What would happen? Well, that's kind of why I dropped out of um, school because I, I don't know why I started getting them. I didn't know they were panic attacks at the time, but I would go to one of the classes, the big classes, and I would just feel like I couldn't sit there and I had to get out. And so that's part of why I think I stopped going to class. But then when I, I, I don't know. I somehow found out they were panic attacks and then I was able to over a year, like overcome them just by breathing. <laughs> it's amazing yeah. what like, breathing well, will do. Actually just knowing what it was, was so helpful because until I figured out what it was, like I went to the emergency room, I was like, I can't breathe. And then I thought, you know, something was wrong with me. And they're like, Oh, there's nothing wrong with you physically. <laughs> and, uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't go see a therapist or get drugs or anything, but just knowing what they were and then I could deal with them. Did you read up? Was it was yeah. there something you Googled? Or well, whatever? at the time I didn't have a computer, but um, oh, right. I somehow, I don't remember how, but I found information about it. And what, is, yeah, what is it? Like, can you, do you, do you have an understanding of it to the point where you could quickly summarize? Like, <laughs> a like, panic attack? Yeah, because I mean, I have a, I had a friend who remember who had one and she thought she was having a heart attack. And yeah. It, it manifests like, in all these like physical ways. Yeah. So. I, when I went to the hospital, I felt like my throat was closing up and I couldn't breathe. And I was, my boyfriend at the time was away and I was home alone and I was just like, oh my God, I can't breathe. And I walked to the emergency room, but it was you. And that's when I was at home, which is odd because usually it would happen in a restaurant or a movie theater or something like where I just felt like I had to get out and I couldn't breathe until I, what got would out. trigger it? Just being around people and like the, the people, like, I don't know. I felt like I was going to embarrass myself or something in that way. And I just had to get away from the people or I mean, it's, maybe it's a little bit of claustrophobia too, because I still get it on planes now. Yeah. But aside from that, I'm good, but okay. on and airplanes, then... I get a little bit panicky. Okay. So what do you do? You just have to breathe. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I just try to breathe. And now I try to watch like the last time I flew to Vegas, I had downloaded the hills on my iPod or yeah. And I just watched the hills and that you like helped. the hills. I had never watched it, but, um, I just talked to Sheila Hetty. That, on, that's and, exactly why right? yeah, oh, is that I had why? just listened to the Sheila Hetty. That's yeah, that's exactly why All right, she good. was raving about it and I had never watched it. And so I watched the first five episodes. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm a huge, I mean, I'm a big fan of that show. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to retread that because I've already talked right. at length about my, yeah, gut, my gushing to, fandom. <laughs> so anything on the plane, not to be focusing on the fact that I'm on the plane. So yeah, I don't like to fly a ton. I don't think anybody, I mean, I think some people just don't care, Yeah. but I can't imagine that anybody, unless you're a pilot or unless you, I guess maybe if you're sitting in first class and luxury or something, <laughs> but flying is just a miserable experience. Yeah. 
You know, what's it's, the, it's, all, it's nice to get there. It's, everybody's crammed in there and it's just people are too close and there's too many of them. And so I take it you're not talking to the person in the seat next to you. No, I'm avoiding eye contact with that person. Headphones on? Yeah, yeah. Unless, I don't know. If it was like a cute grandma lady, I'd probably talk to her. But if it's just like a businessman, then no, I don't Creepy know. business guy? Yeah. Yeah, and that's the guy. They don't want me to talk to them anyway. And... Oh, I don't know. That's exactly who wants to talk to you. <laughs> really? They yeah, just seem like they're preoccupied with business. Some guy commuting. He's like looking at his like spreadsheets or something. Yeah, he's probably bored, but... Um, okay, so you leave Cincinnati... You right. break up with this guy. Well, I I think it was a mutual breakup, but yeah. It was. Mm-hmm. It, like, uh, he might have broken up with me. I actually don't remember, but it was. I think it was pretty mutual. You don't remember? I, 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 I don't remember how it happened. We just grew apart, I think. and so a- I moved. Amicable, essentially? Mm, yeah, pretty amicable. I mean, I didn't talk to him after that, but... <laughs> <laughs> I erased him from my life. <laughs> I don't have any hard feelings toward him. I mean, yeah. All right, everybody. There we have it. That's today's flashback. An outtake from episode 99, my conversation with author and editor and publisher, Elizabeth Allen. The episode first aired on August 26th, 2012. Once again, a reminder that the full episode is available in the feed. So if you want to hear the full hour with Elizabeth Allen, just look for episode 99. It's in the feed wherever podcasts are available. Elizabeth Allen is the founder and editor of an online literary magazine called Hobart. You can find it at hobartpulp.com. Follow her on social media. On Twitter, she's at Hobart Pulp. On Instagram, she is at Short Flight Long Drive. Once again, that is Elizabeth Allen. Her new novel, American Thighs, is due out in 2024 from Clash Books. Don't forget to subscribe to this show wherever you listen. You can also subscribe on YouTube. Follow the Other People podcast on social media, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and Blue Sky. Don't forget to subscribe to my weekly email newsletter over at Substack, bradlisty.substack.com. And if you love the show, I hope you'll join the Patreon community over at patreon.com slash otherpplpod. Help keep this show going into the future. If you have a couple of minutes and you want to do me a quick favor, please give this show a rating wherever you listen. Write a little review if that's an option. It helps the show in the rankings. It helps the show find new listeners. If you want to get an Other People t-shirt or a sweatshirt, you can do that at the show's official website, otherppl.com. And last but not least, a quick plug for my latest book. It is a novel entitled Be Brief and Tell Them Everything, available in trade paperback, ebook, and audiobook editions. I narrate the audiobook, so if that sounds good, go get my novel. Again, it's called Be Brief and Tell Them Everything. All right, so coming up on Sunday, a new episode, a conversation with author Wendy Chin Tanner. She has a novel out, a debut novel called The King of the Armadillos. That is available on Flatiron Books. Had a very fascinating conversation with Wendy Chin Tanner, and you can hear that on Sunday. So stay tuned.